Committee Amwa Committee report and all of that. And we'll give you a bit of history of that as well. We will also show you all the first ladies and former first ladies who have been benefiting from it. So if you have heard the story in dispatches, you know that on Good Evening Ghana, you get the full story. That's why we are here, and that's why we produce this program, because sometimes the news comes in different dimensions. It comes all over the place. What we will do is that we'll put it together on the touch screen, yes, on the touch screen, and we'll give you the chronological, the chronological presentation so that you can get the context of the story, and then you can make your own decision. Sometimes we will add our editorial opinion as well. You, can, you only have to listen to that. You don't have to agree with us, and then you can share your views as well on Facebook. Uh, this program is also on Good Evening Ghana official on Facebook. But our first story tonight is this one. Here is Johnson Asidun Ketia. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, the difficulty, however, with this is that the investigations would concern the Chief Justice, who is the subject of the bribery allegations in this matter, and in whom disciplinary authority against judicial officers is vested under Section 18 of the Judicial Service Act. The Judicial Service Act provides that the Chief Justice is vested with the authority to discipline all the Supreme Court judge. That is, if we decide to go according to that route, then it means that the person who is the disciplinarian cannot be disciplining himself. So if we want to go according to the Judicial Services Act, then the person who is the subject of the allegation must step aside so that uh, other officials will take over during the pendency of the investigation. And if he is cleared, he returns back to post. If otherwise, then it will all come out of uh, the investigation. As I have said, the Chief Justice cannot be a judge in his own course, hence cannot set up a committee to investigate allegations of misconduct against himself. Chief Justice cannot be a judge in his own course. Nemo Judas in Corsa Swaba. What's this matter? It's a very disturbing matter. Uh, disturbing for the allegations that are being made and disturbing also for the, uh, uh, for the politicization of it. Here is a lawyer, a Kumasi based lawyer called Afrifa, who has himself just returned or recovered from a General Legal Council disciplinary action that was pronounced against him to um, stop him from practicing law for four years. In the, uh, during the ensuing period, he got a, a ruling from the Court of Appeal that decided that after 18 months of the service, he should return to practice at the bar. Uh, FIFA is a senior lawyer from Kumasi, and this matter is, is quite controversial. It has to do with uh, some land in Gomwa somewhere. And lawyer FIFA is uh, uh, making allegations in response to an allegations that have been made against him. So he has been reported to the General Legal Council by his client, and the client is asking him to uh, recuse himself from his case, asking to sack the lawyer, basically, and also uh, raising some allegations against him in response to uh, the allegations of the client. Afifa then draws in uh, the Lord Chief Justice in a very, very uncomfortable manner. We have looked at Afifa's, uh, if you like, pleadings in some detail, and we will uh, point out some obvious questions that come to us. Now, the NDC has waded into the matter. And the biggest opposition party is asking some questions of the Chief Justice. They want the uh, inquiry that will, be, uh, that will occur at the Disciplinary Committee of the General Legal Council on Thursday, 15 July, to be televised. They also want the Lord Chief Justice uh, to excuse himself or to recuse himself from the proceedings. You know that the Lord Chief Justice is the... Um, is the chairman of the General Legal Council. Tonight we'll show you again who the members of the General Legal Council are. As we prepare for the big story, uh, which is our second story, and our interview with the Honorable Hassan Ayariga, who is the founder of the APC Party, All People's Party, here in Ghana, let's uh, bring you up to speed on what all of this Chief Justice matter is about. And um, with your permission, can I go to the touch screen and let's do that so we can all understand. Thank you. Okay. So um, here we go. So this is, the, this is the first document. It's a petition against uh, Akwesia Frifa, and it's dated on the 1st of March. This is a petition against uh, the lawyer, the lawyer who 
uh, who is in the center of the controversy, the lawyer who is making the wildest of allegations ever made against any chief justice, I believe, in the history of the Republic of Ghana. This petition is against him, and uh, the client is asking him, uh, is asking, is asking uh, Afrifa to pay some money. Okay, let's look at some of the details Afrifa is talking about. So this is the letter that Afrifa wrote to the General Legal Council announcing his uh, agreement to appear before the council and uh, on the 15th of July by giving the council some information. So uh, that's the letter there. Let's, let's uh, drill down on some of the important aspects of the letter. So let's go to uh, our page three of the letter. It will come up on the screen in a minute and then we can, we can look at it in some detail. Um, our page three of the letter is coming up soon. That's uh, a free first letter to the General Legal Council alleging that the, pe the, the rancor that has occurred between he and his client it's all about the Chief Justice. It's alleging that a client said to him that the uh, Lord Chief Justice said he should change his lawyer uh, because he wants to give him another lawyer. Another lawyer was introduced into the matter and the clients then demanded of him to pay some money, uh, to pay the money that he had already received as his legal fees back to the client. The client alleges that he gave legal fees of 300,000 uh, CDs to the lawyer and the lawyer came back to him with a very curious uh, sort of uh, request. And that's an allegation. We have to state that. The client alleges that the lawyer came up with this curious request. Very uh, unpalatable, is it, as it were. But it's an allegation. He alleged against the lawyer that the lawyer suggested that he will need 100,000 United States dollars, separate from the fees, to do what the client describes in his document as gymnastics at the courts. Gymnastics. That's what the client alleges. Uh, we don't know whether that is true. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I'm still waiting for the, uh, for the document to come up in a minute. So then the, the, um, the, the 100,000 cities, uh, 100,000 United States dollars goes to the lawyer, and the lawyer is not able to do much about it. Okay, so uh, here we are. Let's, let's begin with the facts uh, as Afrifa states them, stating to the General Legal Council what he says are the truth of the facts. So he says that the truth is that a fee of one million was agreed, out of which the petitioner paid uh, 300,000 and undertook to settle the remainder later. So Afrifa is saying that uh, the fees that he collected from the, um, the fees that he collected from the client is 300, but 300 was part payment of 1 million that was agreed. He said, I represented the petitioner in the Court of Appeal, Cape Coast, and the Supreme Court, and also performed other duties for him, particularly at the National House of Chiefs. Now, this is very important. This second paragraph is very important because I'll come back to it when we want to raise critical questions about the, uh, when we want to raise critical questions about the, 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 the points that Afrifa is making. He says, remember this, says, I presented the petition in the Court of Appeal, Cape Coast, etc. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Afrifa says here also that the client was so impressed and satisfied by his services that he wanted to dispense with his substantive lawyer. But he, Afrifa, told the client that uh, he did not come into the case to supplant the lawyer and that um, he, Afrifa, will stop the conduct of the case if uh, the, the, the other lawyer's services were dispensed with. This is also a very important aspect of the matter because a question that we'll be raising at the end of the, of the situation. Afrifa says that one, the clients, he did work for the clients in Cape Coast uh, Court of Appeal. He also says that, the, he says categorically that the client was very impressed with his work. So let's move on. At the end of July 2020, the petitioner informed me that my friends, uh, informed me that friends of his who were highly connected politically had taken him to see the Chief Justice who had agreed to help him win his case on condition that he drops my good self handling, uh, as the lawyer handling the case for him and engage Akutompa Esquire in his stead. So that's another, that's an, another allegation that, uh, that he's making. Afrifa is saying that the, the client told him that the, the people had taken him to see the Chief Justice and that the Chief Justice said, um, the Chief Justice said that they should change the lawyer. Okay, let's move on. Uh, he said, uh, the client then informed he, Afrifa, this is the, this is the dastardly part, this is the very, very terrible part. He said, the, 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 the client informed him that the Chief Justice had demanded a bribe of 5 million United States dollars for a successful outcome to his case and that he, the client, had already paid $500,000 to the Chief Justice. This is a very serious allegation. I'm not surprised that the Chief Justice invited the Criminal Investigations Department of the Police to have a look at that. This is a very serious allegation that Afrifa makes. Okay, let's move on. Afrifa, further, uh, Afrifa says the client further indicated that uh, he, the client, was hard-pressed to raise the remainder of the uh, 500000 
of, of the 5 million, which will be 4.5 million, by the way. So he says that the Chief Justice was asking for 5 million United States dollars. He, uh, the, the client, had been able to generate $500,000, uh, which is, what, 10%? of what he claims that the Chief Justice is asking. And so he's left it a whole 4.5 million to pay. Okay, now uh, he says that, uh, he, he asks Afrifa, Afrifa says that the client asked him to refund 300,000 paid to him as fees because he, Afrifa, had in line with the advice of the Chief Justice, because he, the client, had in line with the advice of the Chief Justice, engaged Akuto Ampao as solicitor to continue the case before the Supreme Court. Okay, Afrifa says here that out of a sense of dignity on his part, he told him that he would rather refund the entire 300000 paid to him and bear the cost of air travel, hotel bills, and other expenditure incurred by he, Afrifa, the lawyer, in prosecuting the case. So here, uh, this is where our curiosity begins. Afrifa agrees to refund everything that uh, the, the client has ever paid him. Things that he charged as a result of legal fees, which is a legitimate charge, of course. He agrees to refund the legitimate charges that a client paid him. And he doesn't just agree to refund it in CDs, the way it was paid to him, but he agrees to refund it in dollars, $50,000, to facilitate a payment to the Lord Chief Justice, a panel member of the matter, uh, because the client is now short of 4.5 million United States dollars, being the alleged demand of the Lord Chief Justice, a panel member on the matter. This is, this is where our problem starts, that the lawyer says that having impressed the client such that the client wanted to retain him, the client comes back to him and says that people have spoken to me and I've been to the chief justice. Chief justice says that I will only win on condition that I take you out, number one. Number two, I will also win on condition that I pay him $5 million. Of the $5 million, I've already paid him 500000 United States dollars. I'm left with $4.5 million. So, Mr. Great Lawyer, I'm so impressed with you, but here, hear me out. You have to give me back the money. The money that I gave you, you have to give it back to me, the 300000 Can you give it back to me? But don't give it to me in cities. Give it to me in dollars. What kind of story is this? I mean, I don't know whether Johnson, I said, before he did his press conference, he, he, you see, I always talk about this. I always talk. I'll never stop talking about it. Did they go through thought process? What kind of story? What, what story is it? I mean, there are many lawyers in the NDC, many, many lawyers, many good lawyers in the NDC, many seasoned practitioners in the NDC. Did they ask them that, do you are practitioners at the bar? You know, I'm, I'm not saying Afifa is wrong or the Chief Justice is right. The General Legal Council will agree, will, will deal with that. But I agree with the NDC that there has to be a public hearing because it's a matter of high public interest. I definitely agree with the NDC on that. But my concern is the story, without, without you knowing anything, I don't know Afifa, I don't, just, just the story, just, just it. It doesn't add up. Any class one student of English literature will look at this story and raise fundamental questions about it. A lawyer works for a client and impresses the client so much that the client wants to keep him. So he and the client are good. The client is a good friend. Client comes and says, I have found another solution, lawyer. But the solution I have found will mean that you have to give me back the money I gave you so that I go and pay a bribe. And the lawyer agrees that I will give the money back to you. Not just in CDs, but I will change it to dollars and give it to you so that you go and pay a bribe. <laughs> anyway, uh, no problem. <laughs> okay, so Afrifa says here that we aggregated the 300000 paid to me as being the equivalent of 50000 United States dollars, which I was to refund to him without any timeline being indicated. He said he wanted the payment in dollars because he was raising the remainder of the money to be paid to the Chief Justice and the currency was uh, was the, the dollar currency was a currency of choice for the Leonard chief justice that's what the guy says okay uh on the 27th of uh, january he paid the guy twenty five thousand dollars to the petitioner and subsequently he's paid fifteen thousand dollars and making it a total of forty thousand dollars and he says that when he's coming for the event on the 15th of july uh, when he appears before the committee he will have ten thousand dollars in his hand uh, he denies any other thing the petitioner said in terms of the gymnastics, etc., etc. Now, let's see the letter that the Chief Justice wrote to the police, and then we'll be bringing this matter to an end. But these are the fundamental questions that we are asking. The fundamental questions we are asking is that how does a lawyer retain his fees, the fees that he charged, 
for which work for for the impressive work that he did how does the lawyer return the fees and returns it in dollars why is the lawyer punishing himself after doing such a good job what's the point and why is a lawyer releasing money to somebody who is telling him the purpose of the money the guy is telling you that i'm going to use this your money to commit a crime a bribe i want to influence the chief justice in bribery because according to him he has asked for it so bring me the money that you have legitimately earned change it to dollars and let me go and pay the chief justice and some people think this is not hearsay i really don't get it i'm totally shocked Okay, so this is the letter that the Chief Justice then uh, writes to Mr. Kenny Eboa, who is the director of CID. Uh, let's look at the, the letter in detail, if you have it. Okay, uh, it says, The attention of His Lordship, the Chief Justice, has been drawn to copies of letters from lawyer Akwesi Afrifa Esquire and his client, the plaintiff, in the matter of, he mentions the case, uh, to the disciplinary committee of the General Legal Council, and which letters are making rounds on social media. His lordship is, is saddened with that without any shred of evidence, his name has been dragged into the sordid and potentially criminal matter. His lordship confirms that he does not know the plaintiff and has not met or seen him anywhere except in the courtroom uh, when he rises to announce his name. Okay, his lordship asserts that he had no personal interaction either with the plaintiff or his lawyer on this matter or in any other matter. His lordship further asserts that he has not demanded or received any money from any person to influence any decision in this matter or any other matter. Indeed, the records will show that the plaintiff unsuccessfully petitioned for the recusal of his lordship, the Chief Justice and Justice Victor Jones Maulom Doche. So this is an important information. So the Chief Justice is saying that, one, I don't know the person, I have never seen him, I've never been influenced, but even if you want to look at the circumstances of the case, that's what the Lord Chief Justice is saying. If you want to look at the circumstances and the record of the case, this client who says that I've asked for five million so that I can do the case for him, I can make it better, and I'm asking him to change lawyers, he has ever appealed to the courts that I, in here, will be taken off the matter because he doesn't want me to be on. He appealed to the court unsuccessfully. So he filed an application. The application must have been denied. That's why it was unsuccessful for two judges, Justice Eni Eboy and Justice Doche, to be taken off. So Justice Eni Eboy is saying that, whilst I don't know him, just look at the circumstance of the matter and the record available. You will see that it's an incongruous story. That's what it is. Okay. The records further show that the Chief Justice was the only judge on a panel who recently, on 31st March, dissented in an application at the instance of the plaintiff in favor of the respondents, the Ghana Telecommunications Company Limited. Okay, so the CJ is saying something else, that there was another matter. One of these uh, uh, matters in between the real ruling, some things come up, sometimes the lawyers call it interlocutories. So one of these matters of, uh, if you like, sub-matter, interlocutory, the, the panel, the entire panel ruled in favor of this gentleman, the, the one in the matter, the one who is fighting with the free fire over money, the one who is alleged to have said that the chief judge has demanded bribe from him. There was a ruling in his favor, but it was Justice Eni Yeboah who was the only judge who dissented. You know? <laughs> so, well, so this is, a, this is a conclusion of the matter. The, the, the lawyer's case has questions, fundamental questions that anyone should pick up. I didn't hear that in the political press conference. No problem. Uh, the Chief Justice has also said something. So the matter is going to the, uh, the, the General Legal Council. We also know that uh, ASEPA have filed an application at the Speaker's uh, desk to the Speaker's office in Parliament asking for the Speaker to do an inquiry into this matter. And they have also filed to the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice. Let's go and look at the members of the General Legal Council and then we can make our point about agreeing with the NDC on this matter. They will agree with the NDC on the position that this is a matter of high public interest. So there may have to be a public hearing. Number one. Number two, that the Chief Justice may have to recuse himself. Justice Eni Eboa, uh, here on your, in your screen, is the chairman of the General Legal Council. He's also the Lord Chief Justice. The Justice Jones Doche, against whom an application also was filed, uh, is also on the General Legal Council. Uh, there's Justice Paul Bafoboni, who, incidentally, is the chairman of the Disciplinary Committee of the General Legal Council. Justice Bafoboni is the chairman of the Disciplinary Committee. So uh, we do not know whether Justice Eni Eboa is a member of the Disciplinary Committee. But if Justice Eni Eboa is not a member of the Disciplinary Committee, I will assume that he's not a member of the, General, of the Disciplinary Committee because he's the chairman of the General Legal Council. But Justice Bafoboni chairs the subcommittee on, uh, on discipline. And that's where this matter is going. So I will assume that Justice Eni Eboa is not a member of that committee. Justice Bafoboni is chairing it. 
next also is uh, Justice Yao Pao. No, no nonsense, they call him. No nonsense, Yao Pao is also on the General Legal Council. Uh, next is the Leonard Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Uh, the Honorable Godfrey Dame is also on the General Legal Council. And then you have uh, Mr. Alfred Tuyayeboa, also a member of the General Legal Council. And then you have Mr. Justin Amenuvo, the famous lawyer for the Electoral Commission in the election petition, also a member of the General Legal Council. And then you have Dr. Ramona Tuguba. He's a dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Ghana. He's a member of the General Legal Council. And then you have Mr. Maxwell Opokwajeman, who is the director of legal education and also a member of the General uh, Legal Council. Then you have Anthony Forson, the president of the Ghana Bar Association. He's also a member of the General Legal Council. And Christopher Archer, also nominated by the Ghana Bar Association, a member of the General Legal Council. So that's what we should expect. Uh, so the disciplinary committee is chaired by Bafoboni, but we are building a serious country. And so uh, give me the Latin maxim, Nemo Judas in Cosa Sua. Uh, let me share that and then let me uh, agree with the NDC on that. Uh, because of this Latin maxim here, Nemojudes in Kosasua. Nobody should be a judge in his own case. No judge should preside over a matter in which he has a personal interest or involvement. It's a canon of natural justice. So this canon of natural justice is very important. And so I agree with the National Democratic Congress. The NDC's press conference today uh, called for this. Nemojudes in Kosasua that uh, a man must not be a judge in his own course. So the Leonard Chief Justice, we will add our voice to the call. Leonard Chief Justice must not be a judge in the matter in which he has a personal interest. He has been personally uh, accused of something, so we believe that he will not be in. And also to the public interest, we think that our society is developing in a certain way. The public interest in legal matters came to an apogee in America during the O.J. Simpson trial, where there was pressure on the U.S. court that the matter must come on television. The trial must be televised so that people can see the jury read their body language and hear the arguments of the lawyers because there was concerns that there will be some racial decisions taken within the context of the matter either against Simpson or for him. So that's where this matter started from and it has since generated such significant interest up onto Ghana in 2012 where we had an election petition that was televised. We have had another election petition that has been televised. Given the high public interest in this matter, Given the sensitivity of this matter, given the sacrosanct position of the judiciary and the head of the judiciary, the Lord Chief Justice, I believe that it is necessary that the General Legal Council must allow a televised event so that people can see their witnesses, people can see their body language, people can, can hear them, and then people can see the way the proceedings are conducted so that by the time the verdict comes from the General Legal Council, everybody is satisfied in himself that this person's allegations are founded, this person's allegations are unfounded. We beg the General Legal Council that let us achieve another epochal success in the jurisprudence of our country by televising this all-important hearing of the disciplinary committee of the General Legal Council. And it will be a feather in the cap of the judiciary and will strengthen the canons of justice in this country. I end my story here, but I cannot end without showing you again Johnson Asiedun Katia. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, the difficulty, however, with this is that the investigations would concern the Chief Justice, who is the subject of the bribery allegations in this matter, and in whom disciplinary authority against judicial officers is vested under Section 18 of the Judicial Service Act. The Judicial Service Act provides that the Chief Justice is vested with the authority to discipline all the judicial officers in the, in, uh, I mean, in the country. But now you have allegations being made against the person who should be the, the one, the disciplinarian. So that is a difficult situation there. Therefore, good governance detects that the Chief Justice steps aside during the pendency of the investigations by the Judicial Service relative to the issue of alleged misconduct on this part as a Supreme Court judge. That is, if we decide to go according to that route, then it means that the person who is the disciplinarian cannot be disciplining himself. 
So if you want to go according to the Judicial Services Act, then the person who is the subject of the allegation must step aside so that uh, other officials will take over during the pendency of the investigation. And if he is cleared, he returns back to post. If otherwise, then it will all come out of uh, the investigation. As I have said, the Chief Justice cannot be a judge in his own course, hence cannot set up a committee to investigate allegations of misconduct against himself. Ladies and gentlemen, The search for a reliable partner in dealing. We also have available the seal of camel car batteries, which I and Kia spare parts, Zonton coaches, and light duty vehicles for everyday movement. Contact us on 020 SA Automobile. The pleasure of doing business with you is all ours. gets dirty and wet after wiping your sweat or blowing your nose with it keeping a dirty handkerchief in your pocket or bag is very unhygienic reusing it increases your chances of getting sick from germs that is why i always use floral disposable handkerchief floral disposable handkerchiefs is disposable thus making it a more hygienic option it's thick and very absorbent with 10 tissues in a pack floral disposable handkerchief is better than a cloth handkerchief Mommy. The flora toilet roll, flora multi-purpose paper towels, flora table napkins, and flora box tissues in a shop near you. For bill purchases, call Delta Paper Mail on 0243-033-033. Bringing you Africa's creme de la creme's classiest hangouts, award shows, end of year parties, wedding, graduations, birthdays, fashion, or corporate events. Metro Social has got you covered. We present bazaars with Je ne sais quoi. Give us a call and we will be there. Whilst at that, join us on Metro Social every Friday at 9.30 p.m. and a repeat on Saturdays and Sundays at 8.30 p.m. on Metro TV. Julia Okay, welcome back to the show, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Now we are on the big story, and we promised you that we're going to show you documents that have never uh, been seen. But our guest is also in the studio, uh, introducing uh, Hassan Ayariga. Uh, yeah, there he is. Yeah, there he is. Hassan Ayariga, wave, wave, say hi. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, doing? you're doing very, very good. How is the APC? Very well, thank you. Ah, uh, I see. So and we're going know. to run through the documents that we have okay. about this matter, and then we'll come to you, and then we okay. can have a full That's interview. Fine. Okay, so that's uh, Hassan Ayaga in the studio. Now, let's, let's start with Nana Atudazi, uh, if we can get it. So this whole issue, from what we have found out, and some of you have seen uh, the text messages go around, that the, the Atudazi sent some notes that went around. And Nana Atudazi said that this whole conversation started at the end of the Rawlings regime. Now, since the beginning of the Fourth Republic, this Article 71, we, we talk about constitutional amendments anyway, but today is not for that. But Article 71 gives the president tremendous power. So the president has power to determine the emolument of all the members of parliament, 275 members of parliament. The president is determining it by recommending a committee, by setting up a committee for the committee to do his work and advise him about it. So that's how it works. Uh, we'll talk about that another day. But for now, that's the information we have to give you. That's how it works. And then the parliament also will look at the emoluments of the president. So civil society have complained about this in the past. They make jokes about it, that the constitution makes a, a scratch-my-back game. 
Parliament scratched the president's back, president scratched the parliament's back, so people make jokes about it. But that's really what the constitution provides. The president determines the emoluments of parliamentarians, and parliamentarians determine that of the president. So at the end of Rawlings' tenure, and I've spoken to a few ministers about this in the last 48 hours, what they say, say to me is that when you start the government in January, Nobody has the real time to start looking at emoluments. So they are paid on accounts. So if I am minister for X or minister for Y, they decide on something to pay me without looking at the emoluments, looking at hours put in, looking at this, looking at that. They don't have time to do that. They are running policy. You can understand. General President is sworn in. There's so much pressure. Name your ministers. Name your deputy ministers. So they all go through this process until the four years. When the tenure is about to end, it is then that they set up this committee. So we started from Miranda Green Street. We have had Ishmael Yamsen. We have had Chin Rehese. Now we have Intiamoa. We are going to continue to have them at the end of every four years. I don't know what Nimoy Thompson put in his document about the, uh, what he put in his document in the 40-year plan, but we're going to have this like that. So when they finish, it is then that they, the committee sits down and look at the, the record of what has happened. And then make a determination that Paul Adamoshi, Minister of X, you have been earning 12,000 cities, but you should have been earning 25,000 cities. So what do they do? They pay me the difference between 12,000 cities and 25,000 cities over the last four, uh, four years, and they pay me all at one go to end the tenure of that term of the president and the government of that term, if I'm a member of parliament, of the term of that, of that parliament. So that's what we look at as ex gratia. So I talked to some ministers today, and some said, in the last four years, some t their salary is different. Sometimes the income is 10,000, sometimes it's 12,000, sometimes it's 9,000, sometimes. So that's what happens. They are paid on account. At the end of the tenure, the committee, uh, Article 71 committee, will now make a decision that, Mr. President, we have been paying you 20,000 cities a month. We actually should have been paying you 45. Therefore, we owe you this amount of money. And then you pay all. That's ex gratia. So that's, that's where it's coming from. Nana Atudazi is a very important person in the foundation of all of these things. You know that uh, the whole Rawlings era has some, some things that we wanted to change. The revolution, the coup, ignoring first ladies and former first ladies. So this was set out for that purpose, that the former first ladies that we have ignored, whose husbands had died in the shooting, the uh, regrettable shooting of the June 4th era, and uh, some of those people who... And Chromer's wife, and that we had maltreated after the coup, and now Mokob Buzia that had been maltreated after the coup. All of these first ladies are still around. What do we do with them? Their husbands were just taken out. Their lives were just driven apart because you're first lady, the coup comes, and then there's a new government, military force. They don't recognize you whether you have a foundation. Whatever you're doing, you can't do it anymore. If you want to continue to live in Ghana, they have been living in misery. Those who want to live in Ghana, it happened to Dr. Nkrumah's wife, it happened to Dr. Busia's wife, Liman's wife, and all that. So Atudasi and the people around Rawlings said that, look, let's do something about this. So they set out the first one that let's call all of these ladies, give them a salary, pay them the back pay, and then let Rawlings exit like that. This was an exit plan for J.J. Rawlings to, to reconcile the nation in the year 2000. And Atudazi says that when he handed this over at the handing over to Jacob Echebi Lamte, Obechebi was very excited. So, so that's the history. That's the history of it. Let's look at the, uh, the, the first ladies. Uh, do we have them? Let's look at the first ladies that we are talking about, those who have been benefiting from this emolument thing. Okay, so we begin with this one. This is what they call uh, Fatia Fata and Chroma. This is uh, uh, Fatia and uh, Fatia Reese, the Egyptian woman, and Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president. This must have been on their wedding day, I'm guessing. Uh, next is uh, J.J. Rawlings and Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rawlings. Uh, this is another couple uh, who have uh, Mrs. Rawlings benefiting from the, uh, the process. Uh, this is John Kufo and his wife, Teresa Kufo. Uh, this is Aliu Mahama and his wife, uh, uh, Mrs. Mahama. Uh, this is Professor J.E. Mills and Mrs. Nadu Mills. Uh, this one is John Dramani Mahama and Lodimna Mahama, about whom there's controversy tonight. Because you know that the story has turned in a way that there's now pressure being mounted on Lodina Mahama, uh, to return some money. But this is uh, President Mahama and Lodina Mahama. Uh, this is Pak, we see Emi uh, may he rest in peace, and Matilda Emi uh, This one is Nanado Danko Akufuado and Rebecca Akufuado, uh, uh, who are in the center of the story. And of course, of course, of course, this is um, uh, Hajia and 
Alhaji Ali uh, Mahama Haji Asamira Mahama and Alhaji Ali Mahama. I'm guessing they didn't get. Oh, they didn't get the older ones. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Baumia, sorry. Uh, okay. Do we have the? But I'm, I was looking for Mrs. Akufu and. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I think they didn't get it. The Mrs. Akufu and Mrs. Achampon, Nama Kobuzia. Uh, it's about them that really the story is. Mrs. Akufu, Mrs. Achampon, Fulera Liman. I don't know whether if you have the, the ladies alone, you can give it to me. I'll show it, please, so that I can, I can show them and make the point uh, very, very well. So, this is how this whole matter started. And then the Ntiamwa committee was set up uh, for this, 2000 and, uh, this uh, 2020. So, the Ntiamwa committee was set up, it went to parliament, and then this week, information came that parliament had actually approved. The uh, parliament had approved the emolument of the president, the spouses, and all of that. So the, the uproar came up. Everybody was shouting. Everybody was angry. Some people said, you can pay them. Hassan Ayaga in the studio told me that, why don't we pay them? We have to pay them. Well, the, the argument is that paying them and making the payment uh, logical was great. Uh, the, maybe there should have been a, a legislation to legislate what they do. We can talk about that another day, but that's not the story we are reporting. The story we are reporting is that there was controversy in the system. Then came in uh, John Dramani Mahama, who gave a lot of institutional memory uh, to it. He gave a lot of institutional memory. So uh, let's look at John Dramani Mahama, what John Dramani Mahama said. He supplied a lot of institutional memory on this particular matter. Uh, they're going to put it up. <laughs> uh, oh, should I? No. Um, yeah, the document is here. Okay, so this is uh, John Dramani Mahama. Let's go quickly through what President Mahama said. So what's the story here? President Mahama is wading into the debate as to whether spousal salaries or allowances be converted to salaries as had been done for Rebecca Akufuado and uh, Hajia, Ramatu, uh, Hajia um, uh, Samira Baumia. And uh, he is speaking about it. He's the immediate past former president. So this is what John Mahama says. The issue of handling spouses of political office holders is not a new one. It has engaged the attention of all governments since the advent of the Fourth Republic. Okay, so he talks about under various administrations, and then he talked about how the, um, the widows, the, the women do well for widows, they do well for HIV, and they do well for the girl child. Okay, he says the practice thus far has become that some expenses of the spouses of the president and the vice president in carrying out their expected roles are funded by the office of the president. This includes fueling of vehicles, security, clerical staff, stationery, hosting of local and foreign guests, and all such expenses. Okay. He says the distinction must be made, however, that this is separate from allowances payable to spouses of the president, vice president, former president, former president, and former heads of state. Okay. He says further that in the first government of the Fourth Republic, that's the Rawlings administration, some recommendations were made to provide allowances to the spouses of the president and vice president, and additionally, as a gesture of reconciling with our past, the spouses of former presidents and heads of state. That's the point that uh, I was making in the history. So John Mahama uh, tells us that, President Mahama tells us that in the... Um, in, in his institutional memory. Since this convention was established by the Rawlings administration, issues in respect of allowances of spouses of the president and the vice president and spouses of former president and heads of state have largely been handled administratively and provided for under the budget of the office of the president. Now, this is very important. He says that this is provided for, President Mahama says, all of this is provided for under the budget of the office of the president. Okay, let's move on. He says this week, now here's the story. This week, a raging issue has generated passionate debate among many Ghanaians, both on social media and in the traditional media space, TV and radio, has been in respect of a report confirmed by government that the spouses of President Nana Akufuado and Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Baumia are to be placed on a monthly salary. Uh, being the spouses of Dr. Mahamadou Baumia are to be placed on a monthly salary at the level of cabinet uh, minister. So the reference is to Samira uh, Baumia and uh, Rebecca Akufuado. That's the reference that President Mahama makes. Okay, let's move on. He says, we are told that the seventh parliament of the Republic of Ghana, which was dissolved at midnight on January 6th, approved the recommendations in the report of the Presidential Committee on Emolument for Article 71 of its holders, chaired by Professor Ya Intiamua Bedu. The news, particularly at this time of austerity, 
Yeah, that's, that's, so this, this, this now comes into the, the real important political talk. It says the news, particularly at this time of austerity, has generated some level of outrage among the populace, and I can understand the anger of those opposing the recommendation of the Intia Bedu Committee and its subsequent approval by pa Parliament. See, so President Mahama says here that the news, particularly at this time of austerity, has generated some level of outrage among the populace. Okay, it should be made clear also that the recommendations in respect of spouses in the Intia Committee report, which covers the years 7 January 2017 to 2021, is solely in respect of spouses of the President, Akufuado, and Vice President Baumia. The challenge, however, is that the spouses of the President and the Vice President are not captured among Article 71 office holders, and therefore, there is no legal or constitutional basis for it. It should be noted that the recommended salaries for the spouses in the Ntia Bedu report are captured as part of the emolument of the President and the Vice President. This seems like an attempt to sneak the first and second ladies into the Article 71 office holders. But here is a bit of a a bit of contradiction because President Mahama in the same statement says that the allowances to the spouses is captured under the office of the president. He said that in this, in this very document. He said the allowances is captured under the office of the president. And then he comes back here and says that uh, the, the, those people are not uh, first lady and second lady are not article 171 holders and therefore uh, it looks like something is being sneaked in. And he says this is clearly problematic. So we have to interrogate that a little bit because President Mahama, in giving us the institutional history of the matter, tells us that the spouse's allowance, including his time, including his time as president and his time as vice president, the spousal allowance is captured under the office of the president and the office of the vice president. But he's concerned that in this particular regard, in relation to uh, Samira Baumia and Rebecca Kufuado, they are being sneaked in as Article 71 uh, office holders. But let's move on. Okay, the Ntia Bedu Committee report rightly makes the case on page 51 of this report as follows. The committee knows that neither Article 71 nor any of the provisions of the Constitution bestows benefits on spouses of the President and the Vice President. Similarly, no legislation mentions what the states should provide for the spouses of the President and the Vice President. Yes. Okay, the question then is, this is President Mahama asking, if the committee recognizes the above and therefore appreciates that there can be no legal or constitutional basis for seeking to bestow any such benefits on the spouses of the president and the vice president, why then did it, provide, did it proceed to provide for the payment of the monthly salaries pegged at the level of a cabinet minister to both the first lady and the wife of the vice president who served in the period 2008 because they were capturing it under the office of the president? They did that. The committee must have done that. Having announced that the, 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 the two ladies were not Article 71 office holders, and with the precedent, as President Mahama tells us, that it is captured under the office of the president, the committee was capturing those salaries under the office of the president, the expenditure under the office of the president. So an appendage of an Article 71 holder is the, is the spouse, because the history from the Atudazi has told us that spouses should be remunerated. Okay, is that also? Maybe you disagree with me. Let's see what you think. All right, let's move on very quickly. And why the parliament also approve it, uh, as has been reported. This, this approved this recommendation without uh, any review. Okay, it says Article 71 is an entrenched clause. Okay, so that's, that's, that's President Mahama uh, speaking about, about this matter. So now the, the controversy is raging and people are talking. And, and so the MPP people start and they are equalizing. They say, no, uh, Mrs. Lodina Mahama has also collected the money. After President Mahama speaks, now they are publishing documents about how much Mrs. Lodina Mahama continues to receive as a former vice president, how much Mrs. Matilda Ayamita Atta receives, Mrs. Liman is receiving, Mrs. Achampo is receiving, Mrs. Akufu is receiving, because they were concerned that the document is presented as though it is just um, Samira Baumia and... Um, and, uh, and uh, Rebecca Akufuado. So that's, that's the goes on. And then comes the, uh, the big story. Let's see. This is Akufuado's letter. So Mr. Akufuado writes, eventually writes, and sets out. Uh, this is the letter that Mr. Akufuado writes. And we'll, we'll put it out properly so you can see it. It says, the attention of the First Lady has been, uh, of the Republic, Mr. Akufuado, has been drawn to the recommendations of the committee established Petuans for Article 71, the Intia Mwabedu Committee, which, among other things, seek to regularize the payment of allowances to spouses of the current president and the vice president, former heads of state, presidents and vice presidents, respectively, as part of the privilege 
privileges due the president and the vice president under Article 71 of the Constitution. The First Lady has taken note of the ongoing conversations in the nation, following on from these recommendations and their bipartisan approval by Parliament, as mandated by the Constitution as the body which approves the emolument of the executive. So these are emoluments of the executive. Okay. It is important to state that the payment of such allowances existed and was made to previous first ladies in the course of the Fourth Republic prior to Mrs. Akufado becoming the first lady. Mrs. Akufado did not request to be paid any allowance. She only received that which existed and attached to her status, albeit informally. That notwithstanding, the public discussion has been laced with some extremely negative opinions, in some cases which she finds distasteful, seeking to portray her as a venal, self-serving, and self-centered woman who does not care about the plight of the ordinary Ghanaian. Okay. In view of this, the First Lady, in consultation with the President of the Republic, has decided to refund all monies paid to her as allowances from the date of the President's assumption of office, i.e. from January 2017 to date, amounting to 899000 uh, 97.84. The First Lady has also decided not to accept any monies that have been allocated to be paid to her pursuant to the recommendation of the Ntia Moa Beidou Committee as approved uh, by Parliament. She is doing this as a purely personal decision without prejudice to the rights of others and not to undermine the propriety of the process undertaken by Parliament. Now, this is a very important part of the information. It's a very important, important part of the letter written by the First Lady. It says that she's doing this purely as a personal decision. So those who are saying, calling on other First Ladies to return the money, the First Lady has something for you to, to, to listen to. She says she's doing this purely as a personal decision. And she's also doing it without prejudice to the rights of others and not to undermine the propriety of the process undertaken by Parliament. This is a very, very important paragraph in this document. Okay, the First Lady does not want these matters to serve as a distraction from the good work that the President, who is currently touring the Savannah and Upper West Region, is doing to develop our dear nation. That's another very important one over there. Okay, let's move on. It says that the First Lady will continue to support the President, as she has always done, in the execution of the mandate entrusted to him by the good people of Ghana. So this letter came out and it sort of completely changed everything. Uh, people didn't know how to react to it. The first reaction I saw, uh, which was in very bad taste, was the complaint that she had used the coat of arms to present the letter. This is a, a first lady presenting the letter out of the office of the president. They said she had used the coat of arms. So, I mean, people were not concerned anymore about the, the money. People didn't seem concerned anymore about the economics that we're talking about. People didn't seem concerned anymore about her so-called selfishness. Now they were complaining about the letter that she, the letterhead that she wrote. Uh, Hassan, you said something. The letterhead. Yes. The, now they were complaining about they were complaining about the letterhead. Why did she use coat of arms? I mean, I think that Ghanaian youth should be very serious. We should be very very serious in this country. We are not pussyfooting and we are not quote-unquote, misbehaving about. We are thinking about the future of a nation. So we complain about money that is going to First Lady because we are saying that it's insensitive, it's this, it's that, it's that. Then she says that I don't want to uh, take the money anymore based on everything that's happening. And one of the early comments from people who are mobilizing people for a better Ghana, it says that, why did she use the coat of arms? Are you, very, are you serious at all? I mean, what kind of, what, what's going on in your head? Well, is, that, is that the point? <laughs> anyway... <laughs> anyway, any, as long as I guy is laughing at the person. Okay, so that's the first lady's first letter. And then there were others who said that, well, you have written a letter and it evinced an intention. That's not enough. After evincing the intention, let us see you actually do it. So that also came as a challenge to the first lady. And then here is a second letter uh, that was signed by uh, Shelley Lai at the office of the first lady. Now, let's look at the letter in detail. It says... I am directed to forward herewith a consolidated bank Ghana limited check number 00 for an amount of 899 uh, being the full refund of monies received from 7 January 2017 to date as allowances given to Her Excellency the First Lady of the Republic. Okay. As disclosed by the statement issued on the 12th of July, Her Excellency the First Lady of the Republic is refunding the amount stated above and also take this opportunity to decline any allowances to be paid to her in future. Her Excellency the First Lady remains committed to her role as First Lady and is devoted to her charity work, championing the well-being of women and children in Ghana. Please accept 
Madam, the assurances of our highest considerations is a letter signed by Shelley Lai, who is in the office of the, of the first lady. So that sort of concluded the matter. And then the politics began. We will not participate in the politics. We'll go to Hassan Ayaga and ask him those questions. What's the politics? The politics is that people are saying that uh, Lordina Mahama, uh, former first lady, uh, former uh, second lady, must also return. But you heard Rebecca Kufado say that she's doing this without prejudice to the rights of other people. Lordina Mahama has a right to keep the money. Lodina Mahama has done some work. She has a right to keep it. Mrs. Akufado says that she is in the hot seats right now. She doesn't want this conversation to distract or detract from the work that her husband, the president, is doing in carrying out his development agenda for Ghana. So she has taken a decision to move. And then as soon as she did, a letter also came from the office of Samira. And uh, that was a much shorter letter. And it is also says that Samira uh, Mahama is also... Uh, returning the money. So both uh, Samira and, uh, and First Lady have done so. Let's read Samira's letter. Okay. The Second Lady, H.E. Samira Baumia, in consultation with H.E. the Vice President, will refund all allowances paid to her since 2017 and will not accept any monies allocated to her, pursuant to the recommendations of the Professor Ya Intia Mwabedu led committee, as approved by Parliament on 6th January. Samira continues, says Mrs. Baumia continues to be committed to the service of the nation to deliver humanitarian interventions and initiatives in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. And the letter is signed by Kwame Chum uh, Esquire. He's a senior aide uh, to the second lady, Samira uh, Baumia. And both of them uh, have now decided to, to take, to, to return the bid. But let's now go to the letters exchange between, and this is the final part, this is what we said, uh, never, never, never been seen document. The letters exchange on the 5th of January, between the 5th of January and the 6th of January, between the president and the speaker of parliament. Uh, so this is the first one. It's a letter written um, to the president, and it's a decision of parliament on the report of the presidential Committee on Emoluments for Article 71 Office Holders. And this is the President's reply. We're going to put these two together. Uh, this is the, the President's reply to, to the uh, document. Uh, so it says, the Parliament says, uh, Parliament considered the report of the Presidential Committee on Emoluments for Article 71 Office Holders and noted a few concerns in respect of the part relating to emoluments of members of Parliament. This is Michael Quay writing. He says, Parliament accordingly made the following observations and requests that the issues raised be below be appropriately reviewed as requested. So Parliament was asking the President to do something. This is what they wanted him to do. Salary. This is on Professor Ntiamu's committee, Michael Kwe, writing to President Akufado, 5th January. He says, the Presidential Committee on Emolument on Article 71 of its holders, in its report, proposed a 10% annual increase on the 2016 approved figure. The justification in the report was that 10% is based on the average annual salary payable to public sectors. Enquiry conducted, however, disclosed that the average percentage increase is 11.4% for public sector workers and was paid as and when it fell due each year. In the opinion of Parliament, this is Parliament telling the President, members of Parliament did not receive any salary increase between the years of 17 and 19 during the periods public sector workers were granted salary increments. Honorable members held the view that since they have had to wait for four years before receiving an increment, a salary increment of 12.5% be granted to honorable members on the 2020 salary amount. The additional 1.1 difference is to account for the value of the money lost over time. So on the 5th of January, uh, Professor Michael Quay was writing to President Akufado asking that Parliament has agreed that they want an increment of 12.5%. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is pursuant to Article 71. The President determines the emolument of Parliament. So President, Parliament is writing to President Akufado that can you allow us to have an increase of 12.5%? Let's see what the, the President says. The President says, okay. He says, I acknowledge the receipt of your letter uh, on Article 71 uh, holders. He says, uh, the decision of Parliament on the report of the Presidential Committee on Emolument for Article 71 holders, January 17 to December 2020, in relation to the members of Parliament. President says, I accept the recommendation in the report subject to the following. On salary, one, President Akufado says, much as I appreciate the reasons given for your request for a 12.5% salary increment, I believe in the public interest. Hear that? Says, I believe that, I believe that in the public interest, and to avoid controversy, we maintain the same rate of salary increment 
across the public sector. Now, this is something that we didn't get to know. This is something that we didn't get to see. Professor Michael Quay in the parliament write to the president and say that, look, we deserve a 12 and a half percent engagement. The president says, I do agree with you, but I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that uh, because of the public interest and to avoid controversy. Let's maintain your salary the same way all public servant salary is maintained. This is all happening at the NTMR report. It says, I accordingly, I recommend an 11.4 increase as has been granted public sector workers every year within the span of time. Yeah, so that's, this, this is something that this is what we said uh, is, is never to be seen. Like this is President Akufado and Michael Kwe uh, talking. And then there was another one. Uh, they'll put the other one. The security allowance. Okay, on security allowance, the President agreed that uh, Parliament should get a security allowance of 5% based on all the things that had been happening. And then there was another one. Let's go to the, the next one. The... Um, the Court of Appeal. So, Parliament is usually pegged on the High Court. And Parliament said that the uh, yeah, President accepts the security allowance. Let's go to the, the, next, uh, the next one. Uh, pa uh, Parliament, the, the gratuity, uh, members rec recommend the gratuity to be paid at the current rate. No, let's move to the next one, which is the uh, Court of Appeal. So, members of Parliament are put on the same scale as High Court judges. Recently, you have seen salaries of High Court judges. Members of Parliament and High Court judges are on the same scale. And then, uh, members of parliament wanted an increase uh, to go to the court of appeal, that they should be equated to judges of the court of appeal. Uh, so Michael Quay says as follows, equating members of parliament to the high, to high court. The House observed that the Presidential Committee on Emoluments for Article 71 uh, ranks honorable members on the same scale as justice of the high court with regard to emoluments. He goes on, honorable members, however, noted that in terms of emoluments, the constitution ranks heads of the following institutions of justice to the court of appeal. The administrator of the district assembly's common fund, that's what parliament observed, that the district assembly common fund administrator is ranked at the court of appeal. The chairperson of the electoral commission ranked at the court of appeal. The chairperson of the commission of human rights court of appeal. The chairperson of the national commission on civic education court of appeal. Parliament has decided that members of parliament be placed on levels analogous to that of the above mentioned heads in respect of emoluments, facilities and other amenities. This request is premised on the fact that the eligibility criteria for persons appointed to these positions are based on the same eligibility and qualification criteria set for persons elected uh, into office as members of parliament. Honorable members therefore request that emoluments and facilities and other amenities be purged at the court of appeal level. He said parliament is hopeful that the above concern will be appropriately addressed for expeditious approval and consequent implementation. So Parliament is telling the President, again, this is all on the 5th of January, you know, that everybody was preparing for uh, all the events. This is what uh, Professor Michael Kwe was writing, the President was writing back. Uh, so they said, okay, we want to be on the same level as the Court of Appeal. Okay, let's see, let's see what the President says. He says that, considering the circumstances that members of Parliament who exit Parliament find themselves in it, it is my opinion. Okay, so this is about when they retire. Let's get to the... Uh, it says here, five, I appreciate the principle espoused in respect of equating members of parliament to justice of the court of appeal and recommend that the next presidential committee on emoluments for Article 71 holders considers this issue in greater detail as a matter of urgency in order to make the appropriate recommendation. So the president, in a nice way, in a very respectful way, tells parliament that it will not be me uh, taking you to the court of appeal, but uh, taking you to equate you to court of appeal. Let the next uh, presidential commission on emoluments do that. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Two things that they disagree on, the outgoing speaker and the president for a second term, they disagreed on how much... Uh, a, a salary rise should parliament get? What percentage should they get? Uh, the president declined their 12%. Then they also wanted another uh, increase that will also take them to uh, another level, which is a court of appeal level, and naturally increase their salary. There again, the president declined and said that, let the other uh, group do it. But for tonight, the big story is that First Lady uh, Rebecca Akufado has uh, returned the money that uh, she has been given out of the NTMA committee report, and so has the second lady, Samira Baumia. And therefore, uh, there is political pressure on especially the immediate past first lady, Lodina Mahama, to do the same. What's your view on the matter? Send us uh, uh, on social media, Good Evening Ghana, Facebook. Uh, for now, though, let's have a glimpse at first lady Akufado's work. We'll come back to the studio with Hassan Ayariga.
it is worth 84,000 cities. The Santa Kino tomb for Saint to the second and his wife Lady Julia were ready to make this happen. They gave their blessings for a second fundraiser to be held at the Mensha Palace and on 28 May 2017, it happened. Edu Atta Bobby, he would 500,000 Ghana cities. He would. Thank you very much. 30,000 cities. A round of applause for Aglo. Whoa, I can't believe my eyes. 100,000 Ghana cities. Thank you ever so much. Angry God Ashanti Obuase. Omo a transfer si kanaba bank no edit statement haba. 50,000 Ghana cities. I saw drawings of it, but um, I didn't know this is how it would turn out. I'm really amazed and overjoyed at, at what I see today. In a matter of five months, we have more than we anticipated. We have a brand new state of the art maternity, new natal and pediatric intensive care units. To support the public health system in Kumasi that currently suffers from a high mortality rate and insufficient space and equipment. The icing on the cake is the breastfeeding area for the mothers. Comfortable state of the art reclinable seats have been provided for breastfeeding. In the past, mothers sat on benches to feed their babies. <laughs> New place na yes ne ho ye kama kama no ho de ye kwa akwala bia won the court ma de bia won baby o be o be da Are you tired as a consumer in Ghana when it comes to issues that confront you as a consumer worry no more of your capital I'm here to give you the information all that you need to make sure that your right is protected as a consumer. We have too many laws and agencies that should protect the right of the consumer. And I'm here to give you the information that will help and assist you to get goods and services delivered to you without any worries. Watch The Capito Show on Metro TV. to you after I've watched it fully and um, and to think through with other people what we can do to help uh, as soon as possible the first move hello Hassan you're unhappy that we've taken some of your time but we have a lot of time for you tonight how are you doing I'm doing great Paul I've been getting a lot of test messages from that they are waiting for you yeah, yeah they, they, want they want to, to hear they want to hear how are you again, Paul, are going to handle this matter? Oh, but this is not the first time we're talking. <laughs> I know. But you are in favor of this payment. I'm in favor of a lot of things. Do you think Article 71 should be amended? Uh, Paul, let me say this. The Presidential Office Act 463 should be amended. Mm -hmm. The president has the power, the executive instrument, mm -hmm. to amend it through the Presidential Office Act. That is what people didn't understand. And he himself probably didn't know that he could do that. Mm -hmm. There was no need asking the committee to do anything. He would do the amendment through his presidential office act. And then it will, because the, the presidential, the vice president and the president himself, their movement is captured under the presidential act. Mm -hmm. And all household workers of the president and the vice president is also captured mm -hmm. under the presidential mm -hmm. office act. So the vice president, workers, gardeners, 
Yeah, they are all paid. They are all paid. So you think the wife should be paid? The, the cook is paid. The cleaner is paid. The house girl and the house boy are paid. Then you think that the president's wife is an instrument for the president. So he comes and look at the instrument and go in and come back. She shouldn't be paid. Do you know what they go through as president's wife? Yeah, before the president, today that be, before even for the, the fact that we have the liberty to insult them, it's, we should pay them. I mean, the <laughs> point here is that we are saying that the economy is hard, the economy is hard. They are part of the economy. We should not say that they are, because they are president's wife, they don't also have oh. difficulty. They do. Look, the kind of support they give our president before they come out to look at cabinet meetings, and go into proposals and policy that will help mm. this country. Mm. Most likely, if you have a good wife as a president, most likely you will discuss it with your wife before you even come out to go to cabinet. Yeah. So the first idea is bound the up first, the lady. Yes. So if your wife says that, oh, this idea of yours is not good, most likely the president will not even talk about it in cabinet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if, if the president's wife says that, oh, yeah, I think A, B, C, and D is good. Go on with A, B, C, and D. It's some kind of support mm -hmm. that we don't and, see. And you, encouragement. And encouragement that you and I don't see. Mm. If the president is sick, the first person to notice or to know that the president is not well and be given the first aid is the wife of the president. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's correct. If the president is in trauma, before you, if you are, have a bad day at home, you imagine when you come to work, what is going to happen? Mm, it's going to be chaos. Worse. Yeah. It's going to be worse. So our first ladies are very important in the life of the president. Mm. Because they help take it or leave it, whether emotionally or whatever. But emotional is also very important. Yes, it's very important in the life of the president. So if we say that all household workers of the president should be paid because they are workers, and the president's wife should be an instrument lying down like a guitar, so he comes and plays and goes in. <laughs> and that one shouldn't be paid because... I don't like the lying down. You can say standing up. Stand, okay, stand, whatever. Stand no, stand whatever I'm like saying... The instrument, where yeah, you put yeah. an instrument, the instrument will lie down, you know, mm -hmm. or sitting there. Standing up like a saxophone. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then they should not be seen as uh, people who play important. Look, they have other functions. Okay, so now that Rebecca Kufado has returned the money, based on the things she says, it's a private matter. Should the, the political question now is, should Lodina Mahama... I, first of all, I think it was a wrong idea for... For her to return for the money. And I think that that is not the right thing to do. Okay. But because Sam Samira Baumi has also returned That is also wrong. They should keep it. They sh they should, but yeah. have you seen the comments on social media? Yeah, but whatever you, you see, do, whatever you you do the, in this country... Yeah, but the opposition social media was racked up against Do you know why this is... For 48 do hours... You know why, do you know why it's like that? No. You see, let me be sincere with you. President Mahama was paying them mm -hmm. 9,000 Ghana cities monthly. Mm -hmm. Quarterly, they were taking about 27,000 mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. Before him, they were all taking all these allowances. Mm -hmm. But you see, when President Nanadu came, he probably think that, oh, I don't like this thing not known to the public. I want it captured. Yeah, to be known to the public. To yes. be known to, uh, captured in a way that yeah, yeah. it becomes a document. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he decided that even though I have increased the salary from 9,000 to 16,000 to them, publishing. it should be captured. And in the process, somebody somehow leaked the information that, oh, the president has asked that he should pay. But this thing was already in existence. Yeah, it is. But that's, 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 president the, that's the point been that the uh, uh, first ladies, uh, PR people were making, that this is not the first person. It's this not is, the first this person. Is, this is happening this all the time. Be, this is happening all the time. Yeah. So why are we now seeing it that it is only because President Nanado wants it to be captured and then put as a legal document. So you support the transparency agenda of Akufado on this I, I support the transparency. This, this, this is not new. You mm -hmm. can ask President, like his, President Mahama said in his write-up, he's, he's done it to the office of the president. If you are living in your private home, the, the budget will be captured under the office of the, uh, what do you call it, chief of staff. Mm -hmm. The money will be given to you to be paid. Mm -hmm. But if not, if you're living in the government home, it is paid to the office of the chief of staff. All these workers. Let me go to Angela and find out what people are saying. Uh, Angela, can you tell us what people are saying very quickly? Right, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Eti Mensa says, what pains me more is that Mal or Dina received this money while the nursing and teacher's allowances were cancelled. Mm. Um, okay. Right. Uh, someone is asking about the uh, legal counsel recusal. There's no female on the general legal counsel. Mm -hmm. Someone says, there's a lot of pressure. People are saying, Lord Dina Mahama, bring our money back. Uh, again, Lord Dina should bring our monies back. Someone is saying, so... 
NDC is also forgetting that Lordina was also taking allowance. She has to pay back all monies due her when she was the first lady, plus other related interests. Uh, someone uh, as well says that either allowance or salary is still Ghanaian taxpayers' money, therefore it should be cancelled. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says, uh, kindly keep your comments uh, decent. Lordina will definitely vomit all the money she took from the state as an allowance when her husband has cancelled trainees and nurses' allowances for his uh, parochial interest. Uh, someone says the First Lady shouldn't have refunded the money, though. Conventionally, it was her entitlement. She didn't rob anyone at gunpoint. Exactly. Precedence was set. There's no legal consequence whatsoever if she keeps it. This is why we must formalize the salaries of president spouses. Someone says, I think the allowance should be paid to the wives of our ex-leaders who were killed for no reason and those overthrown by coup d'etats. But now first ladies and second ladies in the Fourth Republic, I believe you say, should not receive any allowance. <laughs> Someone uh, jokes, before we believe that Rebecca Kufuado would really want to pay this money, we have to meet at the Independence Square and witness it. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says, animal farm. Some animals are more equal than others. Someone also says, if the first and second lady return the money, they have nothing to lose because they are still in power and somehow they will gain more than what they are returning now. Interesting opinion. And lastly, someone says that... Uh, so it's generating, it's generating a lot of uh, oh, yes. interest among young people? Yes, it is. Is it, is it a balanced uh, situation, at least from the little survey on the, on the phone, so that... People think the money was good or it was bad. What, what kind of balance are you getting? It's going back and forth. Some people think that it's fair because uh, they are doing developmental projects and whatnot. Some people think that why should you be taking money because you are the wife of the president or the vice president? So it's going back and forth. People are split. Okay. Keep an eye on that as we listen to Hassan Ayariga. Okay, so, so, so you had, you, there was only one opinion there. I heard you nodding. I saw you nodding to it, which is that it's her entitlement. Yes, yes, they are entitled to mm. it. Look, the mere fact that. Um, um, they are president's wife doesn't mean that they shouldn't be given entitlement. Look, in my policy, the APC policy, mm -hmm. we have a policy that we talk about unemployment benefits. Oh, I'd like to hear the unemployment benefits. Unemployment benefits. Let me it's take a, uh, let me just make an announcement. So we're continuing on social media. Good evening, Ghana at uh, Facebook. Good evening, Ghana official on Facebook and uh, Twitter as well. And then uh, we go off Metro TV at this stage, as we normally do. We are still working on that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll change that. But now we continue with Hassan Ayaga on social media. Yes. Yes. Like I said, we unemployment have, we have a policy that we talk about unemployment benefit. That un unemployment benefit is for, it's a policy made for work people who are not working mm -hmm. in Ghana, and they must get benefit. Because we believe in socialist forum. Which and Metro TV, insightful and inspiring moments.